My boyfriend was testing me by asking me to lend him money and I didn't do what he wanted. When I met him, I didn't think much about where the relationship was headed. I wasn't looking for anything serious at the time. Having come out of a long-term relationship not too long ago. But there was something about him. Something different. Maybe it was the way he carried himself, confident yet soft-spoken. With an accent that hinted at a life lived somewhere far away. It intrigued me. He intrigued me. He had recently immigrated from Turkey, and though he was a little mysterious about his past. I didn't push. It seemed like he was trying to find his footing in a new country, and I understood that. Moving across the world, especially under difficult circumstances, couldn't have been easy. At first, things between us were light. We went on casual dates, grabbed coffee at the small cafe down the street from my apartment, and walked around the city, talking about our favorite movies, our childhoods, our dreams. He was charming in a way that felt both familiar and foreign. He had a way of making me feel seen, of making our time together feel like a shared secret, something only we could understand. It felt nice, easy even. I wasn't looking for anything serious, and I thought maybe he wasn't either. But then things began to shift. We had been dating for about three or four months when he started acting off. It was subtle at first. Small comments here and there about money, about his struggles since moving to the States. I knew he wasn't exactly in a stable position financially. After all, he had just come here, and finding a job as an undocumented immigrant is never easy. I wasn't naive. I knew it was hard for him, but I didn't realize just how precarious things were, or at least. That's what he wanted me to believe. One evening, after a particularly quiet dinner at my place, he mentioned that he only had five cents in his bank account. He said it casually, almost as if it were a joke, but I could tell there was something more behind it. He let the statement hang in the air, waiting for me to respond. I wasn't sure what to say at first, but I had a feeling this was his way of asking for help without asking outright. I had told him before that I could help if he ever needed it. And I meant that, I'm not heartless. I know how hard it is to get by when you're struggling. And I cared about him. I cared about him enough to offer help in emergencies, like if he needed money for food or gas. But this time, he wasn't asking for something small. He came right out and asked if I could lend him $1.500 to $2. I remember staring at him, my mind racing. That wasn't a small amount of money. It wasn't something I could just give away, especially after dating for only a few months. But he asked it so nonchalantly, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. I tried to be kind but firm, explaining that I didn't have that kind of money to lend. I told him that if it was an emergency, I could help him with food or gas, like I had mentioned before. But that was all I could do. It seemed reasonable to me. I wasn't shutting him out completely. I was just setting a boundary. One that felt necessary. That's when things took a strange turn. He didn't seem upset at first. Instead, he smiled, almost as if he were amused by my response. Then he said something that left me feeling completely blindsided. I was testing you. I didn't understand at first. Testing me? What did that even mean? He went on to explain that he had asked for the money not because he needed it, but because he wanted to see if I trusted him enough to give it to him. He said it as if it were some kind of relationship test as if my willingness to hand over thousands of dollars would somehow prove my love or trust in him. And because I had refused, he made it clear that I had failed. I was stunned. It felt like someone had pulled the rug out from under me. Here I was, trying to be reasonable, trying to help within my means, and suddenly I was being told that I had been tested without my knowledge. And worse, that I had failed. Before I could even process what he was saying, he pulled out his phone and sent me a screenshot of his bank account. It had around $1.800 in it, more than enough to cover whatever, emergency, he had fabricated. He didn't need the money at all. The whole thing had been a lie. A manipulation. I felt sick to my stomach. What was this? What kind of person tests someone like that? I didn't know if he truly thought this was a good idea. Some twisted way to gauge my commitment to him. Or if it had been an elaborate plan to scam me. And when I didn't fall for it, he had to backtrack. Either way, it didn't matter. The damage was done. I confronted him, asking why he would do something like this. Why he thought it was okay to manipulate me. To lie to me. He didn't have a good answer. Just mumbled something about trust and relationships. But I wasn't listening anymore. I couldn't. My mind was spinning, replaying the past few months. Trying to figure out where things had gone so wrong. I ended things with him that night. It wasn't healthy for me to be in a relationship with someone who thought it was okay to, 
test, me in such a way. I told him as much. And though he tried to argue, to convince me that I was overreacting, I stood my ground. I had to. After he left, I sat in my apartment. The silence deafening. It felt surreal. Like the whole thing had been some kind of nightmare I couldn't wake up from. I kept thinking about how easily I had trusted him. How I had let myself believe that maybe this relationship could be something real. But now, I wasn't sure what was real anymore. Had he ever cared about me? Or had this all been a game to him? In the days that followed, I found myself questioning everything. Was it a scam? Had he been planning to take advantage of me from the start? Or was he really just that misguided in his approach to relationships? I couldn't tell. Maybe it didn't matter. All I knew was that I had dodged a bullet. And I needed to take some time to reflect on why I had let things get so far in the first place. As the weeks passed, I found myself thinking less and less about him. I threw myself into my work. Into my friendships. Into the things that made me feel grounded. But there was always a lingering sense of betrayal. A feeling that I had been too trusting. Too open with someone who didn't deserve it. It wasn't long before I heard from him again. He sent me a long, rambling message about how he had made a mistake. How he missed me. How he wanted another chance. But by then, I had already made up my mind. I didn't respond. I couldn't go back to that place. To that person who thought it was okay to toy with my emotions. The experience left me wary. More guarded than I had been before. I had always prided myself on being open. On giving people the benefit of the doubt. But now I wasn't so sure. I didn't want to become cynical or closed off. But I also knew I couldn't afford to be naive. Trust is something that has to be earned. Not tested. Looking back, I realized that what happened wasn't entirely about him. It was about me too. It was about learning to set boundaries. To recognize red flags. And to trust my instincts when something feels wrong. It was about realizing that my worth isn't measured by how much I'm willing to give. But by how much I respect myself. And in the end, that's what I walked away with. An understanding that trust. Real trust. Isn't something that can be forced or manipulated. It has to be built slowly. Over time with honesty and respect. Anything less than that isn't worth having. After I ended things with him, life went on, but there was a strange unease that lingered in the back of my mind. I tried to shake it off, telling myself that I had made the right decision and that it was time to move forward. I thought that breaking things off would put an end to it all. That cutting ties would mean I'd never have to deal with his drama again. But I was wrong. The situation with him had only just begun to unravel, and I had no idea how much deeper things were about to go. In the days after our breakup, his messages flooded in. At first, they were what you might expect, apologies, pleas for a second chance, long explanations about how he was under pressure, how he had made a mistake, how he loved me, but I knew better. I ignored them all, trying to create distance, to heal from the emotional damage he had already caused. I thought that eventually, he'd give up, realize that I wasn't going to change my mind. But he didn't give up. His messages grew more frequent more insistent. There was a desperation in his words that made my stomach twist. He told me he had no one else in this country. That I was his only support. That he didn't know how to survive without me. Guilt started to creep in. But I fought against it. I couldn't go back. Not after everything that had happened. I needed to stay strong. To remember why I had walked away in the first place. The messages then turned darker. He began accusing me of betraying him. Of abandoning him when he needed me most. He blamed me for his struggles, saying that if only I had trusted him, things would have been different. He mentioned his immigration status, how difficult it was to be here without proper documentation, how scared he was of being deported. His words were manipulative, twisting my emotions, making me question myself, but I had learned to recognize the signs, to see through his tactics. I didn't respond. And then, one day, the messages stopped. For a brief moment, I felt relief wash over me. Maybe, I thought, he had finally moved on. Maybe he had realized that I wasn't coming back. But that relief was short-lived. The silence, as it turned out, was far more ominous than his words. It started small. I would notice little things out of place. My trash cans tipped over outside my apartment. A package that I had been expecting mysteriously disappearing from my doorstep. At first, I brushed it off, thinking it was just coincidence. Maybe it was the wind. Maybe a neighbor had accidentally picked up the wrong package. But deep down, a part of me knew better. I knew something wasn't right. But I didn't want to acknowledge it. Not yet. Then one evening, as I was leaving work, I saw him. He was standing across the street. 
leaning against a lamppost, watching me. His eyes met mine, and there was something unsettling in the way he looked at me, calm, but intense, like he was waiting for something. I froze for a moment, my heart pounding in my chest, but I forced myself to keep walking, pretending I hadn't seen him. I couldn't let him know he had gotten under my skin. I couldn't give him that power. Over the next few days, I started to see him more frequently. At the grocery store, walking past my apartment building, even sitting in his car outside my workplace. He never approached me, never said anything, but he was always there, always watching. It was as if he was trying to remind me that he hadn't gone anywhere, that he was still in control. I tried to brush it off as paranoia, tried to convince myself that maybe it was just a coincidence, that he happened to be in the same places at the same times. But the longer it went on, the harder it became to deny. He was following me. I started to feel like I was being hunted, like every corner I turned. He would be there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for me to slip up. I knew I had to do something, but the thought of confronting him terrified me. What if he escalated? What if he turned violent? I wasn't sure what he was capable of, and that uncertainty was the worst part. I couldn't predict his next move. I couldn't know what he was thinking. One night, after seeing him outside my apartment again, I broke down. I couldn't take it anymore, the fear, the constant anxiety, the feeling of being watched. I called a friend, someone I trusted, and told her everything. She was furious, not just with him, but with me for not coming to her sooner. She insisted that I go to the police, that I file a report. But I hesitated. I didn't want to make things worse. What if going to the police pushed him over the edge? But I knew she was right. I couldn't live like this. Always looking over my shoulder, always waiting for him to show up. So I went to the police, told them everything. They took my statement but I could see the skepticism in their eyes. To them, it was just another case of an ex-boyfriend not taking no for an answer. They gave me a few suggestions, get a restraining order, change my locks, but I could tell they didn't think it was serious. But to me, it was very serious. After that, I tried to take their advice. I changed my locks, installed a security system in my apartment, and started taking different routes to work. I did everything I could to protect myself to create some sense of safety in my life again. But the fear was still there, always lurking in the back of my mind. And then one night, everything came crashing down. It was late, and I had just gotten home from work. I was exhausted, ready to collapse into bed and forget the world for a few hours. As I walked up to my apartment, I noticed something strange. The door was slightly ajar. My heart skipped a beat. I knew I had locked it before I left. I always did. I stood there for a moment. Frozen, listening for any sound, any sign that someone was inside. But there was nothing, just silence. Slowly, I pushed the door open, my hands shaking. The apartment looked normal, nothing out of place, nothing missing. But there was an eerie stillness in the air, a feeling that I couldn't shake. I walked into the living room, my eyes scanning every corner, every shadow, and then I saw it. On the coffee table, where I had left nothing, was a note, just a single sheet of paper folded neatly in half. My stomach turned as I picked it up, my hands trembling as I unfolded it. It was from him. I'll always be watching. That was all it said. Simple, terrifying. My blood ran cold, and I felt the air leave my lungs. He had been here, inside my apartment. He had violated the one place I thought I was safe. I called the police immediately, my voice shaking as I explained what had happened. They came, took the note, checked the apartment, but by then, he was long gone, they promised to investigate, but I could tell they didn't think there was much they could do. They suggested I stay with a friend or family for a while. Just to be safe. So I did. I packed a bag and left. Staying with my friend for the next few days. Trying to figure out what to do next. I didn't feel safe anywhere anymore. No matter where I went. I felt like he was there. Watching. Waiting. But then. Just as suddenly as it had started. It stopped. He disappeared. No more messages, no more sightings, no more threats. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. For weeks, I lived in fear, waiting for him to show up again. But he never did. Slowly, cautiously, I began to rebuild my life. Trying to put the pieces back together. Trying to move on. I never found out what happened to him. Maybe he finally realized that I wasn't coming back. Maybe he moved on to someone else. Or maybe he was still out there. Watching from the shadows. Waiting for the right moment. I'll never know. But one thing I do know is that I'll never be the same. That experience changed me. 
hardened me in ways I didn't expect. I became more guarded, more cautious, more aware of the dangers that can lurk behind a seemingly charming smile. Trust isn't something I give easily anymore. It has to be earned. And even then, I'm careful. Looking back, I realized that I had ignored so many red flags in those first few months. I had wanted to believe the best in him, in us, but sometimes the truth is too hard to ignore. And in the end, I learned that it's okay to walk away, to protect yourself, even if it means hurting someone else in the process. Because my safety, my peace of mind, was worth more than anything else. And that's the lesson I'll carry with me for the rest of my life.